الكمبيوتر بدور الكرام أخذ سنة فيكم وشرنا حضوركم لهذا لهي المحاضرة بس ما حد عمالنا الثمية حضرية برحب فيكم جميعا ومع نشوش نحن رح أحاول الإنجليزي بس عشان ضيفنا كريم واللي بيحب في سماعات وفي فجمة فوضية وفي الشباب هم معهم سماعات فقيزة اللي بدهم سماعة بسيرفع إيه يرفع إيه إذا بسماعة أخذ Professor Marshal Gandhi of Love, we would like to welcome you in Amman. Uh, Marshal Gandhi is a very unique man. Hope's values, so forth, urgency are just some of the good words of his vocabulary that he has been using for, 20, for 35 years as a thing for community organizing. He was an advisor to President Obama campaign on community organizing and leadership development, and he's professor at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Uh, he uses the language of hope, specifically addressing the minds, hearts, and hands of people, reversing disappointment and restoring shackles of hopes. And he talks very swiftly also of the hope and uh, of the possibility of the possible versus the probability of the problem that he will tell us about. Uh, I'm not going to speak uh, about his life or his bio because he will talk to this and I won't do it justice. Uh, but actually, there are many networks in this room, there are the civil society representatives. There is the private sector, there are the Harvard alumni, um, our partners, our sponsors, who would like to welcome you. And I think the one community that unites us all in this room is our belief in change and our hope in changing our communities in the way that we would like to get to see. And uh, I think what's happening with the unfortunate events in Gaza just irritates the need for, for the skills that I'm supposed to have. And I would just like to give you some brief about a background about this event. Uh, AI has a think tank that was established by the Rita Amman in 2008. Uh, we are concerned about the air and government cities. And in the air governance, what we mean is designing cities and planning cities. But we also mean living cities, managing cities, belonging to cities, and being citizens in our cities. Through our work in Amman and eight other cities uh, throughout Jordan, we have encountered the same challenge again and again, and that is, and that is triggering a stronger sense of involvement and a stronger sense of urgency in order to engage communities in the decision-making processes in issues that would affect their daily life. And we thought that we, we need to make a change. Uh, we invited the GANs a year ago to do training in Amman uh, for 25 community leaders on community organizing and public narrative. Uh, as well as coaching for coaches that will advocate for some of the ideas that he's advocating for. We look at this, at this as a beginning of a longer process, a contribution to the discourse, and maybe a pragmatic exercise that will help these leaders in their daily life. I would like to thank many individuals and institutions that made this possible. At first, I would like to thank the Mayor of Amman for his support for this initiative which is a very unorthodox approach for America to engage people, and I salute him for this. I'd also like to, to thank uh, Marshall Gans and Mr. Hajj, the, leader, the team leader, uh, during this week. And Harit Abu Hawa, who was unfortunately what, what's not with us, but he has done it on this uh, work and uh, this uh, project. The Foundation for Future has kindly and generously supported this event, and the Civil Society Program from the USA did a wonderful job and recruiting leaders for the training. So thank you all for such a wonderful job. I'll leave you now with Gans, just leave you with open hearts for things that you may hear, you may know, but you may not like, you may not be prepared to. So, if Professor Gans, I just grab you.
justice and compassion in the ways that we live and work together. These goals can't be achieved unless the responsibility and the ability to create positive change is shared widely, effectively and equitably within our communities, our nations, and our world. Civic associations can play an especially important part in this mission. Alexis de Tocqueville, the French scholar and aristocrat who visited my country in the early 19th century, observed that civic associations have three critical roles to play. First, they bring individuals into public association with one another, combating fractious individualism and educating as to common interests and the common good. Second, they enable individuals to combine their resources to act more powerfully on behalf of those shared interests. And third, since participation in these associations is voluntary, they serve as crucibles for the renewal of the values that inspire us to act in the first place. Creating this collective capacity is fundamental to a just society, as fundamental as the protection of individual liberty. And this is what community organizers do. Unlike service providers who deliver services to needy clients, unlike advocates who speak for others rather than enabling others to speak for themselves, community organizers identify, recruit, and develop leadership who can mobilize their communities to stand together to learn, collaborate, and act effectively on behalf of their common purposes. The word I often use to describe this is building constituency. I like the word constituency. It comes from the Latin constare, which means to stand together. The craft of a community organizer is to enable a community to stand together on behalf of its own voice and purposes. This evening, as I share lessons drawn principally from my own experience, I hope they may be useful to you as you create your own. My argument basically is that leadership that builds community can best be understood not in a positional way associated with positions of formal authority, but rather as a practice, a way of engaging with others. Specifically, I invite you to consider leadership as a practice of accepting responsibility for enabling others to achieve purpose under conditions of uncertainty. And let me ask you to consider each of those terms. Accepting responsibility, of course, the beginning. Accepting responsibility, however, not for being a sun in the firmament, firmament, enlightening us all with rays of light, but rather for engaging with other people in working together to thirdly achieve shared purpose. And finally, under conditions of uncertainty. When everything is working and there's no problems and no challenges, leadership is not a critical resource. It's when things are not working, when things are challenging, when things are broken, when things are contradictory and unknown, that is the kind of situation that requires leadership. And it poses two kinds of challenges. First, a strategic challenge, which is how to figure out how to use resources in ways that can enable us to meet those challenges. And the second is a moral challenge. How to inspire hope over fear, empathy over isolation, and a sense of self-worth over, over self-doubt. Organizing then as a practice of, is a practice of leadership that asks, as a first question, not what is my issue, but who are my people? Who is my constituency? Who is my community? Who are those who not only stand to benefit, but those who must act on their own behalf to secure the benefit, if it is to belong to them. Second, how can they develop this capacity that they need to act effectively? And third, what is the change they seek? This change, this work can be accomplished through mastery of five practices. Motivation for action based on shared values through storytelling. Yes, storytelling. I'm going to come back to that. Creating shared commitment by building relationships. Structuring authority through leadership teams, transforming resources into power by strategizing, and transforming strategy into achievement through action. All of this, in turn, requires an approach to leadership 
that sees as its most important work the development of more leadership. It's a way of thinking of leadership not like being a dot in the middle of lots of arrows converging on one, which is frustrating for the leader and very frustrating for the arrows that are trying to get the leader's attention. Nor is it based on a view that, that argues, oh, we don't need leadership. Nothing gets done that way. But rather, it's the idea of an interdependent model of leadership that's collaborative and that cascades outward to build the capacity all the way down as needed. And this is what organizers focus on doing. Now, let me share with you just a little bit about <coughs> where this comes from. I grew up in Bakersfield, California, which is an oil and agriculture town at the southern end of the San Joaquin, San Joaquin Valley. It's, it's the part of California nobody goes to, um, uh, unless you have to. Uh, it's not San Francisco, it's not Los Angeles. It's the site of large uh, corporate farms, large agricultural production. When I finished high school there in 1960, one of my main objectives was to get as far from Bakersfield as I could. Um, I was uh, fortunate to get a scholarship to Harvard and started there as an undergraduate in 1960. It was a long way from where I grew up in, a, in an entirely different world. It was a world of elitism I had never encountered before, but it was also a world of adventure and excitement. It was either John Kennedy who was the president. He came to the yard shortly after his election and challenged us with a call to a new generation of leadership. For me, it led to losing interest, I have to confess, in my studies, and becoming much more engaged in the civil rights movement, which was happening all around us. The struggle of African Americans to achieve equal justice uh, in the United States. I got involved in that struggle, I think, for several reasons. Uh, I was raised by parents who taught me that racism, that racism was simply an evil, that it kills. Not a complex ideological or political concept. And the civil rights movement was challenging racist institutions. Secondly, that we have a moral responsibility to act, to claim agency, and to shape the world we live in. And thirdly, the civil rights movement was led by young people. You know Dr. King, when he led the bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama, that started the modern civil rights movement, was 25 years old. Um, a lot of the people leading that movement were 18, 19, 20 years old. And I wondered about the role of young people in social change. And uh, there's a theologian, Walter Brueggemann, who wrote a book called The Prophetic Imagination, in which he argues that, that two components go into what he calls transformational vision. The first one, he says, is a critical view of the world's pain, of its suffering, and of its limitations. But secondly, an appreciation of the world's hope, of its possibilities, and of its joys. And the convergence of that critical view and hope is what creates the energy for change and transformation. Young people come of age with a critical eye on the world they find, and almost of necessity, hopeful hearts. And that combination of a critical eye and a hopeful heart has powered change and transformation generation after generation, which is one reason why our youth are so precious to our future. Well, but then I was a young person. So uh, I left school after three years and volunteered to go to work in Mississippi and Alabama in 1964 and 65, uh, organizing uh, to open up the voting rights uh, and uh, break down the barriers of segregation. And that was really my introduction to the work of organizing. And I want to say a bit about that because it shaped the whole approach that I've taken over my lifetime to it. The first understanding that I gained from this experience was that at that time, the United States, on any measure of social well-being, uh, health care, housing, education, criminal justice,